he won the, to, to show you how good he was, uh, I forget what year it was, but when they had the first big indoor money shoot, and it was in San Diego, he decided to uh, hang up bare boat, and he went into the pro division the you know, summer before. And he shot in the top 20 or 25, I guess, in uh, outdoor on, on field shoots. And then he went to the San Diego shoot the following winter and uh, beat everybody, all the pros that had been doing it for years. He just walked in there and beat them. He never got his money, but uh, <laughs> that shows you the kind of talent he had. And there are stories about him. Uh, he could walk into a room and pick up anybody's bow and shoot in any way he wanted to shoot. So. There are a lot of guys that are always right there, top five, second to you yeah. know, fifth, but they just are never champions. And there's some guys that that are just champions. What what makes a champion? Is it a mental outlook? Uh, what is it? That's a good question. That's a hard question. I don't know. Uh, for me, it was work. Uh, I didn't have the talent, I don't think, that Dave had. Uh, and I had to sweat and work. I shot hours uh, every night. And, uh, and it paid off for me. Eventually, I, uh, I guess one of the other after one of the other main factors, I think, is confidence. And once you work hard enough and, and you see your scores improve, at least in my case, it gave me confidence. And I was able to, uh, there wasn't a target on the range that I was afraid of. Uh, I was a lot smoother than shooting than I am now. Now, now you're afraid to miss where I am. But you knew you could 20 every time. It makes you press. Yeah, I, yeah, I knew I could, and I did. And that's what that's what I did it for me. Uh, when I practiced in the yard, I did it every night. I kept score every night. I shoot a 14 or or even a 28 after work, and I always kept score. And I knew. If uh, what, the, what score I needed to shoot, uh, and I had goals. I set goals every year and uh, worked for them, and, and I achieved most of them. Uh, and each night you go out, if you shoot a 50 half one night, you say, oh, I'll put that in the bank, I can do that again. And that, you know, you get to that magic 500 number, which everybody talks about. Uh, once you achieve it, it gives you confidence, but it's hard work to get there. Other guys uh, may have may have other you know, other answers for you as to what makes a champion. I had to work. It was hard. What makes what makes barebow shooting a passion for you? <laughs> that's a, that's another one I I read question and I was struggling with an answer for that. Um, I guess it's the way I started. And, uh, in the 60s there were more, they called them instinctive shooters than there were freestyles. And so when, when I first started out that's what I was. I, was, I didn't have a sight, didn't know what a sight was. I didn't care to buy one because I didn't have that much money. So <laughs> we started, my brother and I started out shooting uh, instinctive. And I just, uh, I liked it. It was, and we were pitifully bad at it initially. And, and eventually we, I got better. My brother uh, switched to freestyle because he, he was interested in uh, Olympic style shooting. And uh, so I just stayed with the barebow, and, and it was, it's an evolution, you know, it changed over the years. Things came along like string walking and foot grips. 
new compounds, and every change was a new challenge. Uh, and I just never left it. Uh, a lot of guys over the years have said, well, boy, you're silly staying with that. That's just what I liked. Uh, I think I, I've watched a lot of guys uh, that shot freestyle uh, initially that were shooting really fingers with recurves, and they weren't very good archers, and, and all of a sudden uh, along came the compound and the release, and all of a sudden these guys are good archers, and to me it was too easy, they shouldn't have been able to do that, you know. The, the release of yeah, fingers would, is huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, don't, uh, I don't care for it. It made, you know, guys, guys that really couldn't do well at all were all of a sudden good archers, top archers. And that didn't set well with me. Uh, eventually they started running the sport. They ran the NFAA. And uh, you see where it is today. It's almost all releases and compounds. Uh, Manufacturers have made compounds year after year after year. They make compounds that you can't shoot with your fingers. And that rubs me the wrong way. As you can tell, I, I'm a traditionalist, I guess, in a sense, even though I went to the dark side with a compound. Well, that's the next question. <laughs> do, you ever, do you ever miss this girl? Yeah, uh, but I know I can't shoot it anymore. So I just, I'd have to go to a... 25 pound bow, I think. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I miss it. It's fun. I, I enjoyed uh, plinking around with, with you and Paul a week or so ago. That brought back some memories. There's no way I can, uh, I can't physically do that anymore. Tell me about you and uh, and Mr. Groves and and kind of the experiments that went on and how you wound up with these boats? Well, it, it's, it has more to do with uh, David Hughes and, and Harold Groves than anything. Uh, that's the boat. Dave shot uh, the old Wood Riser Groves in 67 and 8, I think. When he came to uh, Watkins Glen in 69, he was shooting this style bow, only a, a shorter version. And uh, he, I mean, that was such a mind blowing thing to watch. Uh, I had to have one, so I literally bought one from Harold. And I, I asked him about it because it was, I thought the bow was too short. I was shooting a Hoyt, 70 inch Hoyt. And he said, oh, we can make it long. So he put these extension blocks in it. And it was very shootable for me. And I, I loved the bow. It was a great bow. And it took me up a couple of notches in school uh, and got me competitive, not with Dave's uh, best scores, but, but with the scores that he was shooting. And this the is the Spitfire. The only uh, experimentation that was done, uh, I don't remember how it came about. I didn't, uh, in 74 I wanted an edge. I'd already shot this two years and I wanted to try something different. Uh, thinking that I could get more speed out of an overdraw and knowing that some of the companies were experimenting with overdraw. I asked Harold about it, and he said, well, well, I'll make you one and send it to you. So it was, I had nothing to do with the design, but but he, uh, I'd asked him about it, and he, he made one up and sent it to me. And of course, I took it to Colorado and found out that people were shooting compounds <laughs> <laughs> and shooting them well. So that was a short-lived experiment. <laughs> you took a break. Came back to archery. Yeah. Had a long time to go fishing, 
think about it, another passion of yours. So what does archery mean to you? Well, uh, I lived and breathed it for a long time, for almost 30 years. And uh, I did get, I got frustrated. Uh, I peaked in 83. And I won it a couple more times after that. But then it was downhill for me. I, I couldn't find bows that worked. Uh, I got frustrated. So I, I did. I got uh, into a fishing club, and uh, found out that I couldn't do both well. So it was time. I just decided to stop. I regret that. I, I wish I hadn't stopped. Uh, I like the people, and that's that's the main thing. Yeah. Go to the tournament, see the same guys a lot, and uh, we develop a lot of good friendships. And, uh, especially the national tournament crowd uh, over the years. So the numbers dwindled each year, but there were still the same folks that you knew, and a few new ones that came along. So it made it, it, uh, it was fun, it was challenging. And now, uh, looking back, uh, I wish I had not. But the sport has changed a lot. I'm sad to see some of the poor attendance. And the NFA is just, to me, it's shriveling up and dying. You know, that bothers me. So I'm glad to be back. Hopefully, maybe we can keep it going. Make a difference. Well, how about we go shoot this thing? We can try. All right. <laughs> These are the original Easton X7s. I think so. Give it a shot. Where do you want me? You even won a uh, national championship with these arrows, right? I think so. I'll have to shoot it instead because I don't have a word up. Everything's going to roll forward. Good. You're gripping the boat. <laughs> you didn't want to lose it. Yeah, because I'm used to using a sling and I don't have a sling on. You just curl your finger out in front of it. Catch it on the way down? Yeah, it'll come out. Roll forward. You're crawling up or down? Not crawling. I'm gapping. Okay, here you go. I think that's better than I shoot. <laughs> They're grouping. I just ain't got them near the dot. Grove Spitfire. What, my, what year was this one made? 73. 38 pounds at 28, main 73. Dyna stressed. Grove's glass. Beautiful. That it is. All right, your turn. My turn. Oh, no. How's that? <laughs> show off. Hope you've enjoyed Stump Talking, a look at the history of the bear bow with Danny Klein. See you next time and shoot them straight.